Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Vivian Williams. Vivian, how many times have you heard someone say, it's not brain surgery? Well, most of the time it's not, but today it is. Neurosurgeon Dr. Alfredo Quinones is joining us from telephone from Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Now he's better known as Dr. Q. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Vivian, for having me. It's quite a pleasure for me to be with you guys. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining us. So tell us a little bit about your background. I think our audience would be interested. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I started being a um, someone who worked with his hands hmm. and used his brain to be able to pick the most amazing tomatoes in the farms of California. Ooh. It, it, well, what is amazing, I still continue to work with my hands, and now I just happen to try to pick some of the most complex brain tumors and some of the most inspiring people in the world. So you know, I continue to use my brain to do so. But uh, I always joke around that about my background. I came from very humble beginnings. I had the pleasure of training at great places like uh, San Francisco, Harvard, and then eventually ended up here at the Mayo Clinic as a Mayo professor. So you reached, quite an reached the pinnacle later in life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so t- tell, you know, you're a busy researcher and you've got a busy clinical practice. How do you manage your time, clinical practice and lab? Well, Tom, I think that the most important thing is that everything revolves around the patient. And I think that that's the most important thing. So for me, it's not that difficult to conceive and begin uh, a number of years ago to realize that the operating room was an extraordinary uh, extension of our laboratory. So I began to collect tissue. I began to formulate hypotheses. I began to get grants from the National Institute of Health. So nowadays, every time I go into the operating room, instead of letting tissue go out and be wasted, I collect it and I ask questions and I continue to advance science. So managing my time between the operating room, my laboratory, and now integrating my administrative responsibility as the chair of the department has been an organic process. And that's how I've been able to do it. And the most important thing, Tom and Vivian, is that I surround myself by people who are much brighter than I am. That's well, the key. Your time management <laughs> skills sound like they're pretty good. I think so, too. It sounds like a living laboratory, an extension of the lab in the OR. Now, one thing that people don't know a lot, I think, of when when it comes to neurosurgery is that sometimes you're awake. The patients are awake during the process. Tell me about that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, I have to disconnect tumors, and sometimes these tumors are near speech areas, not only where you understand speech, but also where you produce speech, which is two different regions of the brain. And then sometimes these tumors are also connected in parts of the brain that will be able to allow you to move your hand, your leg, your face. So I have to be able to go in, and some of these tumors, they don't look like anything, just normal brain. And the MRI, they may look different, but when you open the brain, you're like, oh, my gosh, what part can I take or not take? So I go ahead and map the brain, and I ask the patient, move your hand, move your face, say this, say that, play this music, you know, read that book, you know, tell me this poem, and so on and so forth. And then as I'm stimulating, I'm suddenly beginning to realize, aha, this part of the brain I should not touch, this other part I can take out, and then I begin to make progress in what we do together. So it's essential to have an amazing patient. It's essential to have an amazing neurology team in there and also a neurophysiology and anesthesiologist. So it's a multidisciplinary team. So the only way that I can do it uh, is being at a place like Mayo where you have the best of the best in every single one of those disciplines. But there's not too many parts of the brain that you can take out without causing a functional deficit, are there? Absolutely right. You know, it's amazing. And I think that part of it is evolution. Sometimes when these brain lesions begin to grow, our function begins to move away. You know, it begins to move away. But sometimes it just doesn't move fast enough. So that's why you have to map the brain and try to take those new tumors that have grown, you know. And it is amazing sometimes how our brains, we used to think that the brain was not plastic, Tom and Vivian, but now we're beginning to realize that we have a lot more plasticity and ability to learn new things than what we thought we did. With the patient awake, isn't that painful? You know, it's very interesting. So first of all, but our neuroanesthesia team, which is, by the way, the best in the world here at the Mayo Clinic, they do an amazing job. Before the patient goes into the operating room, they use a state-of-the-art technology, including ultrasound, by the way, to be able to find exactly 
where those nerves that will give you pain are, and they selectively block them. Imagine when you go to the dentist, if they didn't <laughs> mm-hmm. block those nerves, it's the same thing in the brain. All the sensors are in the surface, and they very selectively block them. And then, of course, they give them a little bit of medication to relax. That, that way, when they go into the operating room, those patients are just amazing. It's, it's amazing what they can do. So the pain is really non-existent. It's more of a psychological distress and knowing. That's why you really have to have the best psychologists, the best anesthesiologists there in the operating room with our patients. And you've got them all. Well, you know, I wish I can tell you that I did, but the reality is that Mayor brought them all. So Mayor ah, put yeah. it together. <laughs> <laughs> I had the pleasure of, of speaking to a patient who went through a wig brain surgery, and they said, I was like, isn't that scary? And they're like, yeah, at first it was, but it was so interesting. And so they were kind of intrigued by the whole thing. So, wow, is all I can say. They so, are. They are. Yeah. I tell you, my patients, suddenly they want to see videos. They want to... Sometimes they ask me, doctor, did you put the camera in my brain so I can see my own surgery? Oh, my gosh. Can imagine. It's amazing. That's and you say we couldn't right. find it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about what's new in brain surgery. What are you able to do better than you used to be able to do? Well, there's no question that what we've been able to do just on the, 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 the topics that we just touched upon, brain surgery awake. So now we know that we can use a state-of-the-art technology, you know, artificial intelligence, brain mapping with new machines that allow us to not only monitor at the time that we're stimulating the brain, we can know if the patient is having a seizure or not. Because as you can imagine, we are putting electricity on the brain, and sometimes this brain can get a little bit hyper-excitable. So now we have the ability with new devices that, by the way, we have invented here at the Mayo Clinic to be able to monitor. In addition to that, we are beginning to use more of what we call, you know, uh, robotic surgery. In the brain, we are at the early stages, mainly on those cases where we are uh, doing a lot of bone work. But in the spine, it's a reality already. Sometimes when I go and I have to take tumors in the spine to be able to open or if we have to fuse the spine bone, we can put a lot of those little screws and these little uh, sort of metal things with robots. And that is, to me, is just amazing. So all the way from brain mapping, robotic surgery, artificial intelligence, and new devices that we are inventing, we are making surgery better and safer here at the Mayo Clinic. Absolutely incredible with all the new techniques you have. Well, let's talk about new cancer therapies. And, and I'm particularly interested in your collaboration with Yale University that uh, you were studying how cancer spreads or metastasizes. Well, it's amazing. So there's a you know, it's, it's a, based on a recent paper that we page, uh, published in Nature. It's a collaborative work, Tom, that has been going on for 10-plus years. It, it started before I came to Mayo with my colleagues, but now here between Mayo and Yale. By the way, the, my colleagues at Yale, they used to be at my prior institution. Now we're separated, but we continue to build bridges. And, and of course, the relationship between Yale and Mayo is, is very, very strong in many directions. And this particular work, you're talking about a paper that we recently published in Nature, which we actually elucidated the mechanism, the molecular engine, that one particular protein is called YAP, Y-A-P, that it stands for Yes, associated protein, which is, by the way, is part of another pathway. It's called the HIPPO pathway. And people say HIPPO, like a hippopotamus. <laughs> and I would say, yeah, it is, by the way, because when it is regulated in flies, when you look at them, they look like a hippopotamus. Their eyes get huge. So mm-hmm. that means that this protein is important in organ size. And as you can imagine, in brain cancer, the growth and the ability of cells to migrate is regulated by this particular protein. So this is one of the latest discoveries that we elucidated in brain cancer, and we realized that this protein is not only important, but we also have tools that allow us to block, at least in our animal models, the ability of these cells to migrate, and subsequently we have a deep impact on brain cancer survival in our avatars, in our animal models. Incredible. It is incredible. And tell us about how you're using fat to fight brain cancer. Well, it's the uh, same deal. Serendipity, you know, is always luck or always favors those who are prepared. Mm-hmm. It was an observation where we realized that in fat in our own body, there are these small little stem cells. And we figure, how do I put the brakes on cancer? It has to do with cancer spread. And I said, I can get the drugs there. But it turns out that our own body has cellular mechanisms, other cells try to fight disease. 
And we realized that the cells, in fact, stem cells particularly, have this amazing ability to migrate and chase cancer cells. And then we figure out the way in how to engineer these little, you know, stem cells from fat estrogen horses to be able to carry, you know, signals that we put in there with nanoparticles, by the way. And then they go in and chase these cancer cells and they kill them. And that's based on two papers that we published last year in which we show also that these stem cells from fat, when we engineer with nanoparticles, they can actually have a significant impact on uh, cancer survival in animals, not yet in humans. I'm hoping that in the next five to ten years out of the Mayo Clinic we'll be able to implement that technology for our patients. Boy, we hope Amazing. so, too. That's nothing short of exciting. You know, it sounds like you love what you do. So what's the one thing you'd like patients and their families with brain tumors to know about care, neurosurgical care at the Mayo Clinic? I would say that, you know, we have an amazing team in all three sites, you know, Rochester, Arizona, and here in Florida. I always tell the patient, when it comes to your brain, you don't have a second chance. So you want to be at the best place that you can possibly be. And I'm not just talking about because of our surgeon. It's because the multidisciplinary care, our neuro-oncologists, our radiation oncologists, our neuropsychologists, our neurocritical care, all those different physicians. I estimate that for every patient that comes to the Mayo Clinic and has a brain tumor treated, there is about 100 to 125 people who directly touch that patient. Wow. So never settle for anything less than the best when it comes to your brain. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. you don't just get a doctor when you come to the Mayo Clinic. You don't just get a nurse. You get a whole team. Mm-hmm. You are right. Dr. Q is a neurosurgeon at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. He's involved in some really groundbreaking research on brain tumors, brain mapping, for example, to allow for better, more complete surgery. You want to make sure you get it all helping to discover how brain cancer spreads, which we hope will someday lead to better treatments, and implementing new therapies for brain cancer, including using fat to fight brain cancer with nanoparticles. Dr. Q, thanks so much for being with us. Well, Tom and Vivian, thank you, and thank you to your audience as well. What a great pleasure. Thank Thank you, you, Dr. Q. Thank you, guys.